Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to be with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. We are starting our summer series called Hot Topics. And I want to thank all those who submitted questions way back in April. And we're going to be dealing with a bunch of different um, questions that you had. Politics, abortion, suicide, why am I not healed? And I just want to encourage you to join us the next few weeks as we dive into this. I want to thank those who are with us for the first time. We like to say that you're only a guest once, and then after that you're just part of, your, of our family. And uh, so we welcome you here at Radius. Also, our online family, thank you for joining us today. It's good to be here with you guys also. Today we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit in spiritual gifts. I want to dive right in. And there's three questions we're going to cover. They're in your notes this morning. They're on the back of the worship program that you received when you walked in. Also, if you have the version. Bible app, you can go to the events page and find it there. If you're looking at the version notes, we had four questions, but I cut the fourth one out. We're going to deal with that later. That's about how do you operate in the gifts, and we're going to do a standalone um, session about that. But a lot of these issues that we're talking about are going to deal with topics that the church is navigating in our culture, topics that can be a little sticky, so that can be a little tricky. How do we answer them? And we need to know how to answer them. How do we relate to what's going on? Hosea chapter 4, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Our goal in this series is to give you knowledge, and not just any knowledge, but knowledge from God's perspective. How does God see these issues, these these things, that we as a society are grappling with? Our theme for 2023 is abundance. We want you to have abundant life. And the thing is, if you and I do not have God's perspective, God's knowledge in life, there is no way we can live in abundance. So this will help you and I to have a greater understanding of who God is and how he feels about situations that are going on in our context around us and maybe how we can address them. So this morning, I want to dive right in, and I want to start with question number one. It's there in your notes. It's why are spirit baptism and the spiritual gifts for today? Why are spiritual gifts and Holy Spirit baptism um, still for today? And the answer, letter A, it's a two-part answer. Letter A, spirit baptism is for empowerment to share the gospel. It's for empowerment. God wants to give us power. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when what? When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem... Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And if you look at that, Jerusalem was a city where they were at. It was right around them. Judea was kind of like the, the region, the countryside. You could say like the state of Wyoming, the area that's around it. So it's not just your hometown, but you kind of look out. Samaria, that was a place of outcast. They were half Jews, half Gentiles. They were half breeds, and the Jews had nothing to, to do with them. Jesus said, I don't want you to stay with the people you're comfortable with. I want you to go out and to minister to the people that are on the fringes, the people that are the outcasts, the people that you don't think are worthy to be with God because God cares about all people. And then he says, I don't want you to stop just there. I want you to go to the uttermost part of the world. And God calls some people to be missionaries. For those that aren't called to be missionaries, We support and send those on our back wall there. We have all the missionaries we support. On the first Sunday of the month, we do our missions faith promises. That helps send the gospel to all the world. And Jesus wants us to be empowered to take the gospel everywhere. Now, I've got a glove here, and I'm with this glove is going to represent you and me. This glove, for this glove to be able to give things away... It has to be filled. And this is like us. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, this glove is now empowered to give things away. Jesus is called the living water. And he can give, as as we're empowered through the Spirit, we can share the gospel, and other people can come to know Christ. Who's thirsty? Right here. Okay. You can go get it. Go ahead and get it. We can strengthen people. Give them something. Here's some... Some nuts, some cashews, protein, they build muscles. We can strengthen people when we're filled with the Spirit. Who likes cashews? 
Uh, I saw this hand first, okay. I won't throw it out. I don't want to hurt. That was a little bit heavier than the water. But then also, people need to taste the goodness of God, the sweetness of God. All right? And as we minister, we can give that away. I need some hands here. All right? Yeah, we're just going to move through here. Whoa, look out. Look out. Who's got a hand? I saw a hand here, all right? Anyone else? You see, when you're full of the Holy Spirit, there's an abundance here. All right? Look out! Incoming! Oh, way in the back? Okay. Hike! Oh, sign me up! Yeah! Woo! Good catch! Good catch! All right. There's a couple more. Okay. Oh, sorry, Logan. Here, I'll get two in the back. And I'm gone. I'm empty. Okay. Woo! Yeah, you know, isn't church fun? Church should be fun. God wants to empower us. And that doesn't mean if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God can't use you, okay? I want to make that very clear. But there is a special dynamic that takes place in our lives when we're filled with the Spirit. And I think a great example of that is just when you look at Peter's life. Fifty days before the day of Pentecost... He denied Jesus three times. One was to a servant girl. It's not like she was a big imposing soldier. It was like, man, aren't you a Jesus? No, she was a little girl, a servant girl. But 50 days later, when he's filled with power, he preaches to thousands of people. 3,000 of them receive Christ. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. In your notes this morning, we have some statistics Radius Church, we're part of the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God started in 1914 with 300 people. Today, 109 years later, there's over 69 million people. But friends, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. Every 54 seconds, that's the blank in your notes, every 54 seconds, one believer is added to the church somewhere through an Assemblies of God church or ministry. Do you realize that from the time we started service to the time we're done, over about 90 people will come to know Christ in that time? Isn't that powerful? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Every 76 minutes, one new minister is enlisted, and every 81 minutes, one new church is planted in the assemblies of God. That's the power of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It helps us share our faith. It helps us fulfill the Great Commission. That's why we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. Every follower of Jesus should ardently, diligently seek to be filled and to keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. So we need it to share God's work. We need it to do God's work. It empowers us to do that. Why are the spiritual gifts still important today? And by the way, when we say spiritual gifts, we're not talking about Ephesians 4 where Jesus talks about the vocational gifts of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Those are important, and I just encourage you, Maybe some of you, God is calling, maybe you're young people, or maybe you're, at, you're retired, or you're, you just feel God stirring in your life. God's calling you to be a pastor. God's calling you to be a missionary. God's calling you to do a change in your life. That is one way you can fulfill that. When we talk about spiritual gifts, we're not looking at the vocational gifts. We're also not looking at the, what we call the motivational gifts that are found in Romans 12, like serving, teaching, giving intercession, um, hospitality, uh, various other gifts. We're talking about 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul says, the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. Verse 7, Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The manifestations of the Spirit, they're the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discernment of spirits. There is faith, miracles, and healings, and then there is prophecy, tongues and interpretation of tongues. Those are the nine manifestations of the Spirit. Those are the ones that we're going to focus on as we talk about this. And why are these gifts needed? And the reason for that is letter B, 
Spiritual gifts confirm the gospel. Spiritual gifts confirm the gospel. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his will. God uses spiritual gifts to confirm the gospel. He uses them when people are in a false religion or maybe they're in a works-based religion. God uses the spiritual gifts, signs, wonders, miracles, words of wisdom, words of knowledge to confirm the gospel is real. Last week we shared the story of how the Gideons were doing a Bible distribution in a school in Ivory Coast. A little boy got it. He was from a Muslim family. He took the Bible home. He hid it from his father because father, his father was very staunch Muslim. And their house burned down. Everything in the house burned down except the Bible. The father found it. And when he found it there in the ashes and nothing else survived, he took it to his family and he says, Hey, whose is this? And the little boy hesitantly, fearfully says, It's mine, father. And the father says, Don't be mad. And he said, The Bible survived. My Quran burned up. The Bible is more powerful than the Quran. The Bible's more powerful than the Quran. And that miracle led him and the entire family to receive Christ. For me, I was healed of allergies as a little boy. I had horrible allergies. A church was praying for me 30 miles away from my house, and I just sensed a voice saying, look up at the clock. I did, and my allergies cleared up. It was a little. It was 8.10 when I was healed. The church was praying. When my mom spoke to the lady who was, said that she would take the need to the church, my mom said, what time were you guys praying? And she says it was a little after 8. It was through that that we realized the gospel is real. That these people, they're not just a little fanatical because they clap their hands and they raise their hands. In the church we went to, you stood when you're told to stand. You knelt when you're supposed to knelt. You sit when you're supposed to sit. And it was very quiet. It was very reverent. I mean, this would, I mean a service like this today, that, that was awesome. That was irreverent. That, that was not what we were accustomed to. So we thought these people were a little weird, but when God healed me, my dad realized, my mom realized, what these people are saying, there's something real and true about it. The gifts confirm the gospel. Even tongues and interpretation can confirm the gospel. There's a, a church in Des Moines, First Assembly of God, and I heard this story when we were pastoring back in Iowa. But many years ago, um, a, a lady brought her unsaved husband to church. In the middle of the church service, there was a message in tongues and interpretation. Now, her husband was Italian, and he not only knew the Italian ang- language, but he also knew stage Italian. The Italian they speak on stage is just different from the common everyday language. The message in tongues was given in perfect stage Italian and the interpretation was dead on with what the Italian communicated. And afterwards, the husband, he thought these people knew stage Italian. And when he found out they didn't, that the Holy Spirit gave them the words to speak and it was perfect stage Italian and then interpreted, he became a Christian. You see, the reason God gives the gifts is to confirm. And friends, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Just because he went to heaven doesn't mean he doesn't have power to deliver people, to heal people, to set people free, to save their soul. God wants to do that, and we are now the body of Jesus. When Jesus' body left, he said, you're my body, I'm giving you my spirit. When he was baptized in water, he came up and the Holy Spirit came upon him. Jesus was anointed. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach the gospel, to set free those who are at liberty. Jesus was anointed. He wants to anoint us, his body, to do his work. And so that's why we need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look at question number two in your notes. And that is, why do some say that the gifts are not for for today? That they stopped after the apostles? And I think there's three reasons for this. The first one, letter A, 
is because of Pentecostal nonsense. Okay, Pentecostal nonsense. There has been a lot of weird stuff done in the name of the Holy Spirit. How many realize that? Barking like a dog. Acting like an animal. Friends, that's not the Holy Spirit at work. There's some spirit work in there. It might be a spirit of pride or exhibitionism. I want to be seen. Or it may even be a demonic spirit. Someone's being possessed and a demon's manifesting and people think it's spiritual. Uh, let me throw this out to you. If we're made in the image and likeness of God and the animals are not, why would the Holy Spirit reduce us to act like an animal below the creation God made us with? There is a lot of weird stuff that's been done in the name of the Holy Spirit. And you know what's sad? As we, as leaders in the church, we have allowed it to happen and have not addressed it and said it's wrong. We need, we need to test the spirits as the Bible tells us, the New Testament tells us to do. And so there's been a lot of weird stuff. And we mistakenly believe that signs and wonders and emotional experiences are the mark of spiritual maturity. They're not. It's obedience and righteous living. Friends, I don't care how high you jump on Sunday and how loud you shout if you don't walk straight Monday through Saturday and heed the still small voice of the Spirit. We need to be a people that are concerned about spiritual maturity over our ministry. Yes, signs and wonders are great. I want to see them. But the purpose is to help all people find and follow Jesus, that they become a Christ follower and follow Him. And their life is transformed and they're changed. Not so that they feel good about themselves. Not so they can say, oh, it wasn't that great. You see, too many times people want an experience. They want to feel good. And so preachers have tried to manufacture an emotional experience so people feel good and they'll keep coming back. You get a crowd that way. That cannot be our motive gaining a crowd, making people feel good. Our motive is to help all people find and follow Jesus. That's the reason for the gifts. Not so that we feel better about ourselves, but so that others can come to know Christ. Let's look at letter B in your notes. The third reason some people say that the gifts have stopped is because of a faulty perception of Scripture. A faulty perception of Scripture. You have in the New Testament the narrative books. Narrative means story. It's the story of Jesus' life. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. And then the story of the church, the book of Acts. And some say that the narrative books do not hold as much weight when it comes to teaching truth and teaching Bible doctrine as the didactic books. The didactic books would be the epistles, all the books that Paul wrote, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, etc., James, Hebrews, uh, the epistles of Peter, the epistles of John, those are the didactic books, the teaching books. And some say, well, that the teaching books, they don't talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They don't talk really about speaking in other tongues, except when Paul was saying to the Corinthians, you guys are out of control, you're wild. It doesn't teach that, so it's not for today. It was only for the church era. Well, the problem is if you follow that line of reasoning, you have to throw out or, or minimize the teaching impact of much of the, new, of the Old Testament because Genesis is a narrative, Exodus and parts of Numbers is a narrative, Joshua judges Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Job, Song of Solomon. You've got many parts of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Jonah, and other prophets that are narratives that are telling a story. And if you're saying that we really can't get good Bible teaching out of the narratives in the New Testament, then you've got to hold that line for the Old Testament too. We begin to walk a dangerous line when we begin to exclude certain parts of the Bible because we don't understand it or we don't like it. 
In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he was writing to Timothy, a young preacher, and he was equipping him and helping him, this is what he wrote to Timothy as he's teaching him how he needs to be a better preacher and minister. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All Scripture... All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Even the teaching books. We can get doctrine from the Gospels. We can get doctrine from the book of Acts. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So here's a question. If the baptism of the Holy Spirit that we read about in Acts is so important, how come it's not really talked about in the epistles? And the reason for that, I believe, is that the epistles were written to churches that were already planted and established, or they were written to Christian leaders or to mature individuals who are already grounded in the faith. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that you learned early on as a believer. In fact, in Acts chapter 19, Paul, he talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as he's talking about salvation. He wants you to have both experiences where the Holy Spirit saves you and comes and lives inside of you, but then he fills you, he immerses you, you're baptized in the Spirit so you have power. And these churches, these leaders, these individuals had already received the teaching on the Holy Spirit baptism. They didn't need to hear about it because they already knew about it. In fact, when you read these epistles, they're usually encouragements and warnings. And that's what we see in the few places that we see references to being filled with the Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14, Paul talks about you need to operate out of love as you give the gifts, that no one gift is better than another. He said, and then he gives words about prophecy and tongues and interpretation, that it shouldn't be a free-for-all. It should be decently in order. There should be at the most two or three, and then tongues should be interpreted. Paul was dealing with error that was taking place in the Corinthian church. In the Ephesian church, he said, be filled with the Spirit. And in the Greek language, it really reads, keep on being filled. He was saying, you guys realize this is not a one-and-done event. It's not a one-time experience. You can say, oh, I remember 25 years ago, the Spirit fell on me, I spoke in tongues, and it's done. He said, no, you need to keep on being filled because we keep on needing power to share the gospel, to confirm that the gospel is real. So there's been this faulty perception of Scripture. Look at letter C in your notes. There's a third reason that some say that the gifts ceased. And that is because of an incorrect interpretation of the Scripture. There's been an incorrect interpretation of the Scripture. There's two camps, really, when it comes to the gifts. One is, and I'm going to give you some theological words. You're going to a, you're going to a Bible class today, okay? That word is cessationist. And it means the gifts ceased. They stopped And they believe that after the canon of the Bible was completed, after the New Testament was completed with Revelation, then the gifts, healings, miracles, tongues, prophecies, all of that, they ceased. They didn't need them anymore. The gifts were only needed for the disciples to confirm the gospel. The other camp is what is called continuationists, and they believe that the gifts, they have continued, that they never ceased. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, And this is the passage that the cessationists, they look at and they say, this is why the gifts have stopped. It says, love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. So it is saying someday prophecy, tongues, and knowledge will stop. When is that? Verse 10 has the answer. But when that which is perfect has come then that which is in part will be done away. And so the cessationists say that which is perfect, the word of God, when that was completed, the gifts ceased. We don't need the gifts anymore because now we have the complete revelation of God. The canon was the perfect word. There's no more books after it, so we don't need the gifts. The problem with that 
is that it doesn't fit the context of Paul's illustration. Let me throw out a question to you. How many of you would say right now in this present age, you know absolutely everything about God and His ways? There's no mysteries to you. You know it all. Anybody here? I don't see a single hand. i got to put mine down, okay? Because my knowledge, my revelation is in part. I don't have it all. If that was true, if, if we knew everything, it doesn't fit it. We still only know in part. We don't know everything. This was not referring to the completion of the Bible, but it was referring to the return of Jesus. When he comes back and the world sees him, at that point, everything's going to be revealed. When he sets up his kingdom, we're going to know everything. In fact, when you look at verse 12, it says, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. Mirrors in Bible times were not like mirrors today. How many of you are thankful for your mirror this morning? Yeah, especially the ladies, you know, you you could put your makeup on and all that stuff. Well, back in Bible times, mirrors were polished pieces of metal. Have you ever looked in a a piece of metal and you kind of get a a vague representation, but it's not a crisp, clear uh, image? So that's the picture Paul says right now. It's like looking in a piece of metal, even though it's been polished, it's not clear. It's not sharp. You don't gain. Well, right now, it's a dim image. And that's how it is right now. And I thank God for the Bible. I thank God for the Bible. And here's the thing. Every gift, every revelation of God needs to line up with the Bible. If it doesn't line up with the Word of God, you throw it out. And that's where some have gotten off where they say, well, the Word God gave me, the prophecy God gave me, is direct from the throne, so you've got to do what it says, even if it contradicts Scripture. If someone says that, uh, walk away from them. Don't listen to them. That's a false teacher. And so Jesus wants us to know as much about him as we can, but I'm only going to know everything up in heaven, up when, the day when he's revealed. I am looking forward to that day. All right. Um, let's take a look at the third thing this morning, all right? The third thing this morning. Actually, I'm going to back up a bit. The gifts are for this generation. The gifts are for this generation. Peter told us the outpouring of the Spirit was for all generations. In Acts chapter 2, verses 4 through 18, and I'm going to um, summarize some of this. In chapter 4, it says, They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So when the 120, and realize Jesus appeared to 500 people before he went to heaven after the resurrection. 500 people. Only 120 listened to him and waited for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wonder what those 380 other people felt like when they missed it on the day of Pentecost. I just wonder what they felt like. Man, wish I would have been there. But when the 120 were filled with the Spirit, it says they spoke with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, as the Spirit enabled them to speak. Then in verses 5 to 13, it says Jews from countries all over the world, and it names 16 different regions. They said, we hear them speaking in our own language. They're just Galileans. All they know is probably Hebrew and Greek. They don't know our dialect. They're speaking our language. How is this? It says some were amazed, but others mocked him and says, ah, they're just drunk. It's a bunch of babble. And this is what Peter said. This is how Peter responds to their ridicule. Verse 14, Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. The third hour was 9 o'clock in the morning. Verse 16, he says, This, which is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, that I will pour out of my Spirit on all flesh. Okay, what made them think they were drunk? They were speaking in tongues and in a language they didn't know. 
And Peter said, this, the speaking in tongues, is what Joel was talking about. This is the outpouring. This is the outpouring. That was the sign. Now, I I just want to say something very carefully. Don't seek tongues when you seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You seek Jesus. He's the baptizer, and your goal is power to witness. Tongues is just the sign that it's happened. I, um, what is the, the sign of 4th of July? How do you know it's a 4th of July holiday? Fireworks, yeah. At Valentine's, it's hearts. At Christmas, it's Christmas trees and all these different things. You know, at Easter, it's bunnies and eggs and all that stuff. But 4th of July is fireworks. Now, here's the thing. Many different towns do different things for their, firework, for their 4th of July celebration. The little town that my wife, her parents pastored in was a town of 800. They started at 7 o'clock in the morning with a free pancake breakfast. But these are farmers in northern Iowa, this little community. So you just don't get free pancakes. You get good Iowa pork, bacon, and sausage, all right? I thought there'd be a good amen here, at least from the men's breakfast crew. You know, and, and after that, at 10 o'clock, there was a par- parade. They threw out tons and tons of candy to the kids. And then at noon, they had this kind of carnival in the park with inflatables and kitty games and um, little train rides that were made out of oil barrels and like a, with a riding lawnmower, they pulled them. And then they had barbecue pork sandwiches and a mud volleyball contest and a tractor pull. And then at night, it was a demolition derby. And then it's followed up with fireworks when it's all done. Great celebration. Casper, we go to the event center. My hometown I grew up in, nothing except fireworks. You see, 4th of July can be celebrated a lot of different ways, but there's one sign that always happens at 4th of July. Fireworks. And friends, when you look in the Bible, the pattern with the baptism of the Holy Spirit is fireworks, I mean tongues. It's tongues. In Acts chapter 10, it says, um, when Peter went to the... I'm jumping ahead here in my notes. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. How did they know the Spirit was poured out? Verse 46 For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. God gave them the same sign as he gave the Jews because it would have been easy for the Jews to say, well, yeah, they can get saved, but they're still kind of lower class than us. But God gave them time. Peter didn't even get to say, would you bow your heads and close your eyes and raise your hand if you want Jesus? No, God just blessed them with it. And then in Acts 19, Paul, when he's speaking, he leads people to Christ. We see in Acts 19.6, when Paul laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. They spoke with tongues and prophesied. Friends, the sign of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. And this is what Paul said after he said back in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh. Acts 2 verses 38 and 39, he said, Repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Who did God promise the baptism of the Holy Spirit to? Everybody. All who are afar off. Friends, that's us. So it is for everyone. It did not cease in the first generation after the apostles. Let's take a look at point number three there in your notes. In the New Testament, and this is a question someone asked, both Mary and Zacharias were filled with the Spirit and never spoke in tongues. Why do we say tongues the sign of being filled with the Spirit if they weren't? And the reason is that even though Mary and Zacharias were filled in the New Testament, it was pre-cross. It was pre-cross. You see, when you speak in tongues, and we read it in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit who lives inside of you gives the words to say. The Spirit is saying the words. Before the cross, the Holy Spirit didn't live inside of anyone because our sin did not allow the Spirit to live inside. So in your notes, before the cross, 
the Holy Spirit did not dwell in people. Before the cross, the Holy Spirit did not dwell in people. But now, after the cross, what has happened is that we have the indwelling Holy Spirit so he can speak through us. It's interesting, but in uh, the New York Times, November 7th of 2006, there was an article called A Neuroscientific Look at Speaking in Tongues by Benedict Carey. This story was also carried on Nightline Online around that same time. And uh, the article says, Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania took brain images of five women while they spoke in tongues and found that their frontal lobes, the thinking, willful part of the brain through which people control what they do, were relatively quiet, as were the language centers. The regions involved in maintaining self-conscious were active. The women were not in blind trances. And it was unclear which region was driving that behavior, the, the speaking in tongues. The amazing thing was how the images supported the people's interpretation of what was happening, said Dr. Andrew B. Newberg, leader of the study team. The way they describe it and what they believe is that God is talking through them, he said. You see, when God baptizes with the Holy Spirit and we speak in tongues, the Holy Spirit gives us the words to say, I don't know what I'm saying. And so this is what tongues is in your notes this morning. Tongues is a personal prayer language that expands one's prayer life and it edifies the believer. Tongues is a personal prayer language the Holy Spirit gives us and it expands our prayer life and it also edifies, it strengthens us. I think probably one of the biggest mistakes that Pentecostal and charismatic churches have done is we haven't trained and discipled people in realizing that tongues is a prayer language. We, we talk about it as it's the sign that you've been baptized in the Spirit. We talk about hearing messages in church and them being interpreted. But friends, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that the Holy Spirit wants to pray through you. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, I pray in the Spirit and I pray with my understanding. In other words, I think about what I want to pray and I pray it. He also said, I sing in the Spirit and I sing in the understanding. I, I, I sing worship songs that we sang today. I maybe sing a worship song and make it myself, but then I sing in the Spirit. I sing in my prayer language. I sing in tongues and I just worship God. God wants you and I to have our prayer life go to a new level. Yes. Have you ever been praying and you feel like, I don't know what more to pray, but you don't feel like you're done praying? How many of you ever felt like that? That's a great time to start praying in tongues. 1212, our corporate prayer meeting on Wednesdays at 1212, those prayer cards that you fill out, we pray for those every Wednesday. I can't tell you how many times when I'm here at the altar and I'm picking up one of these cards and I'm praying, I'm looking at it, and I'll pray in English, but I'm going, God, there's so much more here that I have no idea what it is, and I'll just begin to start praying in tongues. And I, I don't know, maybe it goes a minute, two minutes, and I pray, and I'll put the card down and go to another one. And what's interesting, and I don't know what I'm saying, but the words that I say for one are not totally the same as what I say for another. Because, you see, the Holy Spirit is giving me words to pray for people, for those situations. And so God wants you and I to be people that are praying in the Spirit. Because it expands our prayer life, and also it edifies and strengthens us. I know of a policeman who said, I do 20 minutes of a tongues therapy session on my commute home from my shift. He says, I need that with all the junk, all the trauma, all the things that I see as a law enforcement officer. Man, if I bring that stuff home to my family, it messes with it. I pray in this spirit, and he just washes me. He cleanses me. He recalibrates me. There have been times in my own life when I've been going through a problem, a situation, and I'm just at my wit's end. I don't know what to do. I'm frustrated. I'm upset. And I don't know how to pray, what to pray. I'll just start 
praying in the Spirit or singing, worshiping in the Spirit. And as I do, the Holy Spirit just begins to comfort and encourage and strengthen and edify and build me up. Jude told us that when we pray in the Spirit in chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Spirit. Paul echoed the same thing in 1 Corinthians 14, 4. And so I want to encourage you, number one, if you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, exercise your prayer language. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, yeah, I've been baptized in the Spirit 15 years ago. That's the last time I spoke in tongues. Or it's been two, three months since I've spoken in tongues. Friends, it is a gift to expand our prayer life and to strengthen you and me. It helps us. It builds us up. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. You know, when I look at all the work Paul did, the churches he planted, the books of the the Bible he wrote, and it's like, wow, how did he do all that? I think a big part is he was a man of the Spirit, a man who was intimate with God. And the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the speaking in tongues was an integral part that strengthened him and helped him to accomplish everything he could do. And I want to encourage you, there are some of you here today, you've never been baptized in the Spirit. Maybe you're afraid of it. I get that. When I was pastoring in Iowa, my secretary, she'd grown up in a denomination. Her dad was a preacher in it, and they were cessationists. She had been taught the gift stopped. They're of the devil. She had a really hard time receiving that. I know some people feel they're unworthy. I'm not spiritual enough. And that's the fear they deal with. I know there's some people, their fear is, well, you know what? I've asked before and it hasn't happened. I don't want to experience failure again, so I'm not going to ask this time. I'm, not, I'm done seeking it. It's just not for me. Friends, whatever your fear, whatever your hesitation is, give it to God. Ask God to take away your fear because here's the thing. If you have any fear, God's not going to force a gift on you if you're afraid of it. He's not going to do that. Just as your father doesn't give a snake when you ask for a fish, he's not going to give you something you don't want. If you think it's a snake, you think it's a stone, it's a barrier from receiving it. God wants his church to be full of power. He wants you to lay hands on the sick and see them recover to give people words of knowledge, to have discernment of spirits of what's going on, to do miracles. Because he wants all people to find and follow Jesus. And the power of the Holy Spirit helps us to accomplish that mission. Let's pray this morning. Lord God, you are a limitless God who has given us so much. Thank you, first of all, for Jesus who died for our sin. None of us are worthy. All of us deserve eternity in hell. We thank you, Jesus, for your blood that you shed for us and that if we repent and are baptized, we can receive the Holy Spirit. Father, I pray right now that you would help us you would empower us that we would be open to everything that you want us to have. In your notes this morning, we've got two next steps, what to do. And the first one there is to repent and become a Christ follower. There may be some of you here today, whether you're here for the first time or maybe you've been coming to church for quite a while, you know that you're not right with God. You know that you haven't Ask God to forgive you of your sin. You haven't repented of it. That word repent, it means a change of mind, a change of direction. It's like a U-turn. I was following what I wanted to do, but now I've changed my mind. I've turned around and I'm making God the leader of my life and I'm doing what he wants. And this morning with no one looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you'd say, you know what, I'm not right with God. Maybe you've been trusting in your religion. I trusted in the church I grew up in, being a good person. 
Friends, if my good works, going to church, taking communion, being baptized, doing good deeds, if that could get me to heaven, Jesus didn't need to die on the cross. If you're here this morning and you need to turn from your sin and turn to God, whether you're in the house or online, I'd like you to just to raise your hand this morning. Thank you. I see that hand. They're on the side. Thank you. They're in the back. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Anyone else would say, I need to get right with God. I'm confessing my sin. That was what the message we heard for tongues and interpretation. Confess your sin. Don't hold on to it. Those of you watching online, if God's speaking to your heart, you can feel him tugging on you, convicting you. Just put your hand up wherever you're watching us today. Anyone else in the house, you'd say, that's me. I need to be cleansed. I want God to wash in my sin. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Anyone else this morning? I want to repeat this prayer, and I would like everyone to repeat after me. No one praying alone, okay? Lord Jesus, I know I've done wrong. Forgive me. I turn from my sin. I stop living for myself. I will live for you. I will follow you. You are in charge. Thank you for dying for my sin and for your great love. Amen. Amen.